say it's been very nice to meet all of you and have a chance to uh, hear everyone's uh, perspective on a lot of Japanese performing arts. Uh, later on, in, okay, well, I'll use this part of the time, if that's best. Um, a little bit later on, I think my hands are going to be full, so it might be difficult. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the Kusei in No, and, and kind of uh, because we're going to demonstrate in a little bit uh, several examples of Kusei, and uh, just to uh, sort of give you an idea of how we <coughs> um, deal with these. And uh, as many of you know, I'm sure, uh, structures are very important in no. And I'm sure what many of you do, there's structures are also very important. But uh, no is highly structured in, in, uh, in terms of uh, its literary qualities, its musical aspects, its movement. Um, so, for example, you probably have heard of, I mean, some of you, I think, probably have heard of Dan. These are larger structures or oftentimes translated as scenes. Um, uh, it usually has to do with, um, uh, well, one particular section, which the Dan then is divided into smaller um, sections called Shodan. And these Shodan, uh, I would say in particular, have characteristics uh, uh, which I think you would, could call the building blocks, and I think it's been used uh, with that terminology by several different people. But the building blocks of no. And so I think um, Tom mentioned how you know certain things come together and often uh, one particular shodan is followed by another one. But that same shodan could go into a different one and everything just gets built in a slightly different architecture. Um, but in any case, knowing these structures, knowing that these structures then uh, have these characteristics of literary characteristics and musical and movement. And when I talk about musical characteristics, there's uh, characteristics in how the melody is created and what the drum patterns are or what the flute plays. So all of these uh, are elements, and, and uh, once you get to know some of them, you recognize them very quickly. And Kusei is one of those. It's one of the more complex ones. It's hard to say that it is the most complex structure because there are there's actually a certain freedom to create other structures too that are going to specialize. But what is interesting is that a Kusei, it comes and is used in, in um, I wouldn't say absolutely all no, but almost all no plays have a say of some type. Um, so it's once you become used to it, um, it's it's highly recognizable. Um, I wouldn't say that my explanation or our demonstration will guarantee that the next time you go see no, you'll be able to recognize it right away. But I bet over time, if you were to study like uh, all our members are doing that going to see a new no play, all of a sudden, say, oh, this is a say. Um, there are other things that, that are, you know, are signals that you know, people will be aware of that. Now, historically, the say is very important to know. Um, it was brought into no, uh, generally thought to have been brought into no by Kan Ami, who was Zayami's father, and so it would have been in the 14th century. And uh, presumably, he knew some Kusei Mai dancers, uh, generally thought to be largely uh, women, female dancers, uh, that, who were performing uh, popular songs and dances at the time. Uh, some of you might have known Shirabyoshi, and I'm not going to go into the difference between the two because I don't, I'm not quite sure I know. I've read different things, and some people say Kusei Mai sort of developed from Shirabyoshi, uh, but in any case, that's a little bit more of a complex kind of thing. Michael might know a little bit more about that issue. He's staying away from it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that encourages me to stay away from it as well. Uh, um, but 
uh, I think what was important is that its introduction to no really um, sort of created a much more interesting musical aspect. Because introducing se musically also influenced other aspects. And there are certainly other structures within no, but, um, and then some much more simpler structures. But even those were uh, then uh, uh, influenced by the introduction of Kuse. And so I think what is really important for it and what Kanami did and why that period in the 14th century was a big change and of course going on to Zeami and his uh, introduction of the concept of Hana particular, particularly, um, I think uh, those were the periods, Kanami and Zeami, in which No took a, a big, uh, made this big change. And of course, when we talk about the No repertory, now the classical No repertory, we're talking about uh, this period of time largely from there, from the 14th century. And, and of course, Michael talked about it the other day, uh, where what we <laughs> talk about the 240 to 250 plays are almost all from this period of time, from the um, 14th century uh, up to the Edo period, or just a little bit before the Edo period, presumably. And so uh, uh, those, that was really the time for somehow, for some reason, that was really recognized at the time when uh, I think musically uh, things began to take off and, and, uh, and obviously with um, Kanami and then his son Zami, um, it sort of really uh, built up. So in many ways, this historically, Okuse is extremely important to the history. Uh, well, historically it's very important to know. And, and so um, not just, uh, uh, not just any old structure in No. It's a very complex structure and very interesting. Now, men, probably many of you are aware that uh, No is often talked about, and this has its, because of its poetic uh, um, orientation, uh, of, of structures called, uh, or seven and five syllable structures. And of course, if you look at haiku, 575, or, or waka, Five seven five seven seven is it? Um, although I've seen a lot of five seven five seven five again, and uh, you know it. Uh, in any case, five and seven, and with no, you often talk about shigocho, seven five syllable structure, and so you see this a lot. So I want to look at a very well known example, and actually Laura just mentioned the example of. Uh, uh, the ha Hagoromo Kuse, um, and I left it in Romaji, and I apologize. I think if I was a little more uh, ready in advance, I would have put it all in Japanese as well, but because I know many of you can read that. But this allows us to look at a syllable count, is what I was trying to do. And the first line, for example, Harugasumi is five syllables. And normally we're talking about seven and five, but it starts with a five, and so it's something called a tori. Tori refers to the fact that you, in, and I should say, this is where the complexity is. Maybe I'll step back once. Uh, and I'm not sure how far I'm going to go with the talk, this talk. I mean, there might be a point where God will say, eh, maybe it's time to just shut up. And uh, um, because there's a, little, there's a lot to explain, and I don't want to get too caught up in details. But um, we talk about seven and five, but we also talk about uh, uh, an eight-beat um, sort of uh, phrase um, straight. So yatsu, yatsu byoshi is what you would have. And so you have seven and five, but a lot of this is over eight uh, beats. Now, we'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit, but, but in any case, so the first kind of phrase is not an eight-beat structure. A tori refers to the fact that it's just a four-beat measure, I guess you would say. And so harugasumi is four beats. And then hanabiki ni keri hisatata no. Very typical, seven and five. Tsuki no katsura no hana yasaku, seven and five. So everything we have is five, seven, five, seven, five. But now what happens, particularly in a kusei, 
It's not to say it never happens in some other structure. It does. But largely what is interesting about Okuse is that it breaks away from 7 and 5. 7 and 5 is the standard, but by breaking away, um, you create both uh, literary interest, no doubt, but um, I would say, or textual interest, perhaps I could, should say. But I think you really cr create musical interest. And because you have to do something else to fill out the eight beats. And so um, this is, I just kind of want to show you how is this done. And I put the syllable structure. Geni Hanakazura, that's two and five. Yirobeku wa haru no shirushikaya, eight and five. So there's a lot of five at the end, but omoshiro ya ame nara de five and five. Here we get another seven and five. Koku mo kaya nari ame. That's what I say. Kumo no kayo jifu. Then we get this, tome no sugata, four and three. Shibashi todo marite, three and five. So, I mean, now, maybe I didn't really explain where this is being divided. And what you talk about in no is the kami no ku and shime no ku, which has been translated as upper hemistitch, because it's, um, the text is usually brought down. Upper hemistitch, the lower hemistitch in English, but kami no ku, shime no ku. So there's a way to divide this. So you would say, omoshiro ya ame nara den. So here is the dividing point for five and five. Omoshiro ya ame nara den. Koku mo di, again seven, amatsukatsu. So this is what we see, and, it, and why don't you just move to the next slide, and... Uh, oh, is that it? Okay. It looks the same. <laughs> Languages. Um, so two and five, six and five, seven and five, another tori. And that's interesting because here you have seven and five. You don't need a tori. That's a compositional choice. So you learn that in, in composing for no, at a certain point you would like to create this kind of space because tori kind of stretches things out a little bit. And um, so you can see going on seven and five, six, five, eight, four, four, five, seven, five. So there's a lot of seven and five. But let's go back once more. And uh, I like to use this, and, and I know um, those who uh, those who in theater know about who have been students of mine uh, <coughs> have heard me use the same these same phrases, particularly the second phrase, because. What does it mean to say that 7 and 5 is the standard? And that's what I kind of want to explore right now. And I have what I'll introduce tomorrow as my otsuzumi right here. Um, because I'll be playing otsuzumi and I'm going to be playing this. But what this is, is, is uh, called a hyoshiban or a rhythm block, I guess some people call it. And, and then you have... Uh, I mean, traditionally they were made with old uh, uh, fans, but they're hari uh, ogi, uh, that is uh, fans that have been wrapped. Generally, they were with paper. Um, these are now ones that you can buy. Quite nice. Um, <clears throat> but what this is very typical for certainly for Hayashi uh, uh, teachers, and then for. Um, uh, for shitekata as well, too. This is where I really can't use this <laughs> with my hand. <clears throat> so, hopefully this will pick up some of that if there's an issue. I didn't play this in such a way, of course you would be sitting down, um, where I consider this the otsuzumi and kotsuzumi. So you could play yo ho Yo, ho, ho, yo, ho, yo, ho, ho, yo, ho, yo, ho, ho, ho. Anyone have an idea of how many measures I just played? <laughs> he should know. <laughs> Good. 
Um, yeah, and so basically three eight-beat measures, although the eight beats were kind of uh, all over the place, um, and in what would be Hyoshi uh, Awazu, or an unmatched rhythm section, where it's kind of, um, where there's not a direct correlation between a syllable of text and what the stroke is. Uh, but a kuse is not that, it is matched. So you have very similar uh, uh, patterns, but they're much more rhythmically strict, we'll say that. And, but for example, one is what we would call, generally we call misuji. My school, Nyotsuzumi, calls it koyai, other schools call it misuji, and certainly the Kotsuzumi calls it misuji. And so we call a misuji singing style, is a singing style that goes with this pattern. And using this, for example, Tanabiki Mike Ri is the Kami no Ku, the upper hemisphere, Hisakata no. And so the way that would be played in terms of the Otsuzumi, Tanabiki Mike Ri, Otsuzumi plays it, and then Kotsuzumi comes in, Hisakata no. So, just two measures where you have seven and five syllables. And, uh, and it follows this very strict pattern. Now, seven and five, though, did you count eight beats? Maybe this will. There's another pattern which is the other standard pattern. Mitsuji is the one where I like to say the patterns of the drums match the, uh, the sync. So that's one thing. Now we're going to go another way. And when the drums play a different pattern, it forces the singers to match the drummers. And that pattern is a continuous pattern or called Suzuki. And you could do this, yo, ho, ho. Yo, ho, in the Otsuzumi, or Kotsuzumi, ho, yo, ho, ho, or together, yo, ho, ho, yo, ho, ho, and that's eight beats, right? So you can actually play that that was the same thing, but the singing has to change. And you'll notice that there, you might not have noticed, because I'm going very fast, three places where um, the syllables get held. And because you have five, seven and five, that's 12. Three places, syllables are held, that's 15. At the end, there's a break, 16. So 16 fits into 8 pretty well. But what happens, there's kind of a slippery kind of situation in terms of counting beats when you're doing mitsuji, the other one. So listen to the two. I'm going to do the one mitsuji style. Again, that's where the beats match singing. And then in the Suzuki style, where the singing matches the beats. Let's just See if you understand what I'm talking about. Tana biki ni ke di isa ka tano tsuki no katsura no hana yasa ku. Going back. Tana biki ni ke di isa ka tano tsuki no katsura no hana yasa ku. So you kind of see where there are two different drum styles and they're different kind of Mitsuji patterns and kind of Suzuki patterns. And it forces the singing to be done in a different way. So what is really quite interesting about it, although most of us, when we learn it, we know you're going to do this, so we know what's going to be done. Um, but there are different schools of Otsuzumi and Kotsuzumi, and they do things differently. And so, in terms of the entire repertoire, you know, you have no actors, there's no way that they can know 
every time one thing is going to be one way or the other. So they have to process this very quickly. And you, you begin to learn to do that. I mean, Tana Biki Nike Biki Sapa Tano Tsuki no Katsuka no Hana Yasaku Tana Biki Nike Biki Sapa Tano Tsuki no Katsura no Hana Yasaku. And that's just based on seven and five which is the basis, the, the basic thing. So once you get into two and five and eight and five, four and three and three and five, then all of a sudden a different complexity comes about. And that's where it's not impossible, believe it or not. And uh, I mean, a lot of times when we're learning it at first, uh, we just learn, do this. But later on, uh, particularly once you start studying Kotozumi or Otozumi, you start studying any of these drums, then you have to start internalizing it uh, in what you do. Now, uh, yeah, I'm sure you understand that perfectly. Uh, <laughs> it's complex, I realize that. Um, why don't we move forward to Atsumori now? And so here now is Atsumori, and we're going to perform this for you in a little bit, and I think you've been given sheets now uh, it's the exact same thing as on the sheets, and so for right now you might want to look at this. Later on when you sing, uh, if you're tired of looking at us, <laughs> and you want to follow along, you can do that. But to the left, for example, is the um, Kusei in Japanese. And uh, one of our, David Crandall, whose picture Tom uh, showed a little bit uh, a while ago, um, uh, was the translator of this uh, version of, of Atsumori, and uh, he actually, even though he himself is a whole show performer, he based it on the uh, version of a score that I wrote out for the Japanese. And so it actually follows the, the Kita uh, score, musical structure, more than it does the whole show. Even he himself is more of a whole show, or is a whole show uh, based um, performer. But you can see, and I think there are several places where there's a change. And this is his choice. I don't think necessarily, and later on John will present something on Sumida River, which um, uh, Julie also mentioned this morning, we did for the University of Hawaii uh, a number of years back. And um, I don't think I felt when I was creating that English that everything exactly had to be the exact same syllable count. I think sometimes that pushes things in ways you don't have to do. Um, because you can work. As you say with a say, there are a variety of syllable counts. And so you just deal with the slight change, uh, which is one less or a little bit more. But what we were trying to do with Sumida River, and I shouldn't jump into what John's going to talk about, is present it the way, basically, it is to be performed if it was to be done in Japanese. So we're trying to do it in English in that same way. And so when we do Atsumori here, we're going to do both versions. We'll do, not simultaneously, by the same person. No one goes to the Japanese and then the English. But you can see already, Shikaru ni heike already that's a tori, but with the, the lament of the heike. Uh, so this is a choice, a compositional choice, I would say, even though he was choosing to uh, how to translate it, um, uh, that David, as a translator for this, made. So yo tote ni ji u yo ne that's five and six. Yo o tote ni ji u yo ne five and six. Masters of the world four. <laughs> 20 years and more. It depends on where you want to divide this. And, and, uh, but part of it has to do with where the drum uh, strokes come when it's being played with a drum. We won't, the first time through here, we won't be doing this with a drum. But, so in any case, uh, you know, in a sense, this makes a lot of sense. Um, sometimes one might think this is a little artificial because there's a little um, play there that's not so absolute that you have to count the syllables in the exact same way. 
Um, but there are places where we have seven and five, and when we actually perform it, um, you know, it depends on who might be playing. We might do what I just did here and sing it slightly differently. So seven and five, if it's being with a Mitsuji pattern, we'll, we'll sing it straight. And, and I should add that when we do Suutai, uh, we're just going to do this as chant and a dancer. Um, we don't sing the drum patterns. We're going to sing it in a different way than if there were drummers playing. Um, and then after that, yeah, well, I'll jump ahead, but it's just to kind of show you this. And I kind of want to move things along here. And then we go finally to, um, I mean, it's pretty much the same thing and you have it. So we'll do Atsumori in Japanese and in English. Then we'll go to Blue Moon over Memphis. And this is a piece by uh, Deborah Borton, and I think a couple of, uh, Gary, I think, will be talking about this. Uh, but this is one of the pieces that we'll be doing tomorrow, and you'll get to see it. Uh, there are only six of us, and actually six um, actors do not a no to make. So um, sometimes it's, uh, a, you know, it's a little difficult. We're taking different roles. But, um, but I've tried to do the same thing. And uh, this is something that I worked with Deb the, uh, uh, actually over several years. I'm not sure who brought it, either Elizabeth or John mentioned this to me. I think maybe Elizabeth actually gave me the text and I read it for the first time because when I heard it for the first time I thought, what? No? Elvis Presley? Oh, you don't know. Blue Moon Over Memphis is about Elvis Presley. And uh, I thought, uh, what? <laughs> they do not seem to go together. And, uh, and I think many, many of you might think, might think the same way. And, uh, but reading it then, I mean, that's what I thought when I first heard about. When I read it, I started seeing that possibility. And in a writer's workshop we had in New York City in maybe, I don't know, about 2004 or something. Uh, uh, I think Deb, Deb was there and, and so uh, met her at that time and then started talking about this possibility because in fact she wrote it as a play which had a no structure. But first of all, it was to be done, it was to be performed by uh, uh, sort of a, a university where she was teaching at first of all and, and kind of in a realistic manner. It wasn't to be done in no style as such. So the short of that is that it was way too long, so we had to cut it down. And so over maybe about three different summers when I was uh, having gone to teach in, in Bloomsburg, the No Training Project there, then going to New York City, and would just meet her for a day or two. And we would go over and cut things down and talk a little bit about, about these various things. And finally, uh, several years ago, um, actually, <laughs> five of us here were all there. One, two, three, four, five. Yeah, five of the six were the ones who were at the first session where we really tried to figure out what we're going to do with this play. And we had a residency up in upstate New York. And, uh, and that's one of the things that, that uh, uh, where we really moved the play along. By that time, I had, well, while we were there, I was kind of finishing uh, <laughs> composing, and then there were little bits and pieces that we thought that, oh, I wonder if Deb would change that wording, and we got back to her, and, and she would come back with a little bit of this or a little bit of that. And, and so we pretty much got it in shape at that particular point. Um, so uh, we will, I mean, so I've done the same thing here, and that is what is on the papers that I think you have in front of you. Um, I guess what maybe somehow, um, what was the title of mine? <laughs> the title was something, uh, it's transition from Japanese. I guess it's, um, I'm not sure if I'm giving a clear answer or a clear suggestion, this is the transition. But I did want to point out what happens in terms of literature. Uh, and what you'll see here, there's a lot of variety just like there is 
in a Cusay otherwise. And so pretty much following the typical Cusay um, sort of style of, of, uh, of how you deal with these, this variation in, in text in terms of syllable count. And I probably should say one more thing because uh, I would also say that I'm not trying to use, or I don't think David is also has done some, uh, some composition as well. Uh, we're not trying to use English in the same, exact same way Japanese is used. Um, I've always talked about how the text and choosing what the text is going to be, you want something, um, I like to use the word meaty, rich as individual words that have, or weight, perhaps I should say, that have weight as individual words, and therefore um, they can be sung, instead of dwelling on to the, and <laughs> using short prepositions or, or articles. Um, I, but I try and avoid those. That said, it's never completely avoided. And so how can you make that come alive and, and try not to necessarily force the, the English into sounding like it's Japanese. It has to live as English, um, uh, just the same way that Japanese has to live as Japanese. And so there are various issues. I'm not sure if others will talk about it, how one ends words and things like that. There are a, a number of difficult issues there because the structure of English is different from Japanese, as one would expect. And uh, so this is kind of what we have done. So uh, to end up what I'd like to do, I'd like us to do uh, where the whole big question, do we get all dressed up or not? We decided this is sort of informal situation. So we're just going to be in Tabi. And that's the formal side of what we're doing. <laughs> then we'll be dancing.
simple beds. How we long for our home, far from this lonely beach. Here on this desolate sea strand, we now must abide by, banished forever to this rustic place, tragic end. A sad disgrace for this one's proud clan. Thank you. And then uh, next we will do uh, from Blue Moon over Memphis. And uh, this will do uh, with me playing my modified Otsuzumi. <laughs> and uh, Gary will play Otsuzumi, Laura will play flute, and uh, John will dance. And then I'll also be singing and uh, Tom and we join together. So this will have sections where there are will be this um, Meet City and Suzuki uh, section as well. Sorry. Yes, this is the Kusei of Blue Moon of Remembrance. And that's the entire text? Uh, no, actually it goes on to another page. We just don't have a page. Oh, maybe we do have a page then.
seen with clenched fists until he grew tired of being elders presley and died like one night from an So, uh, actually, could I have at least the, the first half presenters up here and... and uh, oh. So I won't make any convening remarks. We'll just go straight into <coughs> questions, and if there's some time for some summation at the end, perhaps. Yes, please. Um, I wasn't, what is the school of the choreography that you have used? There was uh, a this is all you. Uh -huh. What is the gesture that you did in both with uh, the, the fan? They are. I thought it was what, the pillow fan. Yeah. But it is. Yeah. Uh -huh. There's a reference to a pillow, right? There. Okay. And, but you did this that story as well. In oh, did he do it in? There's a person. Did he do it in? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. starting yeah. where the rest was on face. Oh, uh, that's another thing. It's hiding the face. Mm. So in one case, it's using it as a pillow. In another case, it's to hide the face. It says basically the same pattern. Yes, yes. The gesture is pretty standard, but depending on what text is behind it, it can take on many different. I've always seen it with the, the dancer kneeling down and hiding the face. Too. I think the first time I see it standing, so I, I like it a lot. And Gary, what is the school of voice that you have that you follow? Kita. Kita? No, all of this. We're all Kita. Um, the people here. We, there are company members that we have that are not of the Kita Sorry, school. Sorry, I don't. But okay. most of the most of our company members. Kita has been contaminated, or maybe I should say, cross fertilized with Hosho because of David Crandall. Thank you. Okay. Um, any questions? For yes, please. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Sorry if you mentioned this um, in the beginning. I had to come late. But uh, I have another choreography question, which is, um, of course, in the lyrics you mentioned, you know, Ellis is known for his, you know, his hips and his hip swivels and things like that. And I'm wondering. In the choreography, with something so important to the story of Elvis, I saw a sort of vigorous stamp at one point, and I'm wondering if there's anything that um, uh, was modified because of this very important sort of choreographic quality, or maybe not just you know Elvis's hips, but you know anything else in terms of Elvis and the story that contributed to uh, maybe not a transformation of choreography, but a kind of inspiration in the way that, that you performed it or put it together. Less well, done. Yeah, I mean, the mic, the that's the only one that's I really... That. <laughs> <laughs> that's clearly, you know, modern. <laughs> but everything else uh, is really just from no, all the rest of it. We try, again, as, as I think comment, Rick, once we're really trying to fit uh, or, or expand no into to English, so... Um, you, you know, one thing this reminds me of, and I think maybe he mentioned to you, he might have mentioned at Bloomsburg, I know he said it to me a couple of times. One person who's come to uh, Bloomsburg a lot, uh, Laura had a picture of him, Akira Matsui, he's also a Kita actor. Um, he's always uh, kind of said, well, you know, you can make anything into a kata. And if you look at a lot of no plays, well, is that kata? in any no play, someone might say, the, holding the mic. No, it isn't, but there are a lot of plays in which a particular kata only appears in that no play. And if that no play did exist, that kata wouldn't exist either. And so, yes, you need to create certain kata to, to fit. Of course, if it becomes something clear different, that's not what we're after. But as John said, we're trying to do it with the intensity, with the feel of no. And so some people might say, Wow, do you think there's that kata that actually exists? 
<laughs> it sounds like Sorry. it sounds like you're on a horn of a dilemma there slightly. In that one way, you want to be um, to be you know not to not plain vanilla. You want to follow some of the. You want to have recognizable cutters, the stamping, the various hidaki and so on. And at the same time, you want to you know to to you know in this case the mic. You want to have things which are distinctive? How did you work out? I mean, maybe that's can a little bit respond to that? Yeah, yeah I, I think um, what happens in practicality, I think in this play in particular, there are maybe two original kata in this play, the mic kata and the guitar kata, right, I'd say. Uh, only two in, you know, 50, 48 minutes or a 50, 50 minute piece. And I think what ends up happening there is someone who's seen no for the first, or see, who's never seen no, is going to see gestures and they're going to make associations. Somebody who, ha who has seen a lot of no, those things are going to stick out and they're going to be like epiphanies. If we put in 50, it wouldn't work. But if you, if you have two in the course of 48 minutes, then there is that little moment of, of recognition. And I should say that, um, I won't say specifically what it was, but in the music for this piece, in the Kakeri section, I had one of those, first time I heard Rick play the flute uh, for the Kakeri section, there was one of these just these moments in which whether or not we're doing no didn't matter anymore because there was something there that I was primed for by my expectations and I was totally taken off guard and, and also delivered into the realm of the story. So um, the point is using it very, very sparingly and also trying to reach a variety of people whether there's, they've never seen no before or whether they come with the background of no. Right, I saw it in Tokyo yeah. with, a, you know, with a mixed yeah, audience yeah, yeah. actually. Many of the people, right. both foreign and Japanese, hadn't yeah. seen no before. And, uh, and I guess mainly my point before wasn't clear. I really feel that Akira Matsui was kind of saying, well, yeah, right. you no. need to create no. I mean, if you're going to do a new no play, chances are you're going to have to create a, a patterns that are just for that. No, that's I think is for Yes, any other questions? Please. Just on the same point, when you were doing, when you were doing fans tearing to pieces, anything he touched, pulling nails from his fence, uh, what movement? I have a feeling you were doing a movement then. <laughs> that, yeah, so. So if I had sleeves, right, uh, it would be this, yeah. Uh, but see, I'm doing. I'm <laughs> very naked. Just to let you know, there was a lot of discussion about what we were going to wear today. I never do know like this. I feel very strange. So, uh, uh, yeah. So there, there would be more movement. And tomorrow, you'll see. Well, I'll have a, I'll have a kimono on. Okay. And what does it mean, pulling nails from his fence? They literally took nails from his fence. That's oh. uh, crazy. Okay, it's not him personally. No, no, no. no. <laughs> he was up on that cross. No. <laughs> No, actually, I mean, I learned a lot. I don't even think Deb was actually a great Elvis fan. She said she did have a cousin who was. Um, but there are a lot of these things. She did a lot of research. And all of these things have pr presumably happened. So, I mean, that and the whole thing of, of closing his fists so people couldn't grab the rings off his fingers and things like that. For having one of Elvis' nails, it's kind of like having one of Buddha's teeth. <laughs> kind of. Kind of. <laughs> and just, I just want to say too that because this is a, a Shinsaku Mura, this is a new thing, uh, the choreography is changing every single time we, we do it. Like, we get, at, we get feedback from everyone, from the audience. We get, now, is it changing drastically? No. But uh, people, at least the people within the company who have now seen it a number of times, they say, oh, maybe you wait just two more words before you go down. or. You know, I thought it was better when you turned left instead of turning right, and I, we're constantly playing tug of war with it. And I think if someone else stands that they would do it again quite different. Actually, this reminds me of when the five of, not Laura, Laura wasn't there, but uh, Elizabeth and Gary and John and Tom and myself were at this in upstate New York working on this. We came, and it was for the crusade, wasn't it, that we all made let's all make an individual choreography and so i think each one of us thought that theirs was the best but um <laughs> but in the end john was dancing so it, uh, it's, it's actually quite interesting how similar uh they were we we do because we all have been doing no for for some time we have the, we have the same vocabulary in our bodies and so there were many places where we all did even a silent stamp rather than a full stamp we all thought well this is a good place for a silent stamp and we didn't choreograph them together, we went off separately and did it, so. Um. 
that's actually a, a point that we didn't really have time to cover, but in terms of creating of the work, um, it happens over, over time. And because we live in different places, um, as a practical matter, there's some work that you can do by yourself, and there's some work you can only do when there are other people in the room. So um, a play like this, the first approaches about this play with 2004, I think maybe around that. Similar, so that's a 12 year span. Similarly, the play we just did in Boston, uh, Zadi Dates and Poppy, is written by a playwright who's not a company member but who's, who has trained with us. Um, that play was conceived uh, also in 2004 and finally given a performance in 2016. So it was, I shouldn't say it was conceived, it was based on her husband's experience as a fighter pilot in the Iraq War. And she actually started writing in earnest around 20, 2009. Um, then she got a, she hired one of our company members as a composer, 2011, and then workshopped bits of it over time, and we and then got funding. And we had so th the lifespan of a piece from conception to realization can sometimes take several years. Was there another question? Yes, yeah, please. Uh, you already answered some things I wanted to know about the process, but I'll just ask another question. This is purely out of curiosity. Um, have you presented this in Japan, or are you planning to? Or the other thing is, are you planning to collaborate at some point with, you know, Japanese trained no performers? Well, to bring this I, to this? were you here at the very beginning? Oh, when Tom, right at the beginning. I can Tom I can showed like, so, right. a piece yes. pagoda, and that was actually a collaboration oh, okay. um, with uh, us and and the Oshima No Theater people, okay. and we were doing that at the National No Theater in that particular. Um, performance was at the National Neuro Theater in Tokyo, and so um, and that state was Japanese. And that state, yes, was was the only female professional stay actor in the uh, Kita School. But would you also bring this new project to Japan? Uh, we did, and uh, at least Michael saw it. Uh, we did in May in a very very small spot space about. A third the size of this space, maybe. <laughs> the entire I mean, theater, like the stage yeah. was like the stage was about the size of this desk. <laughs> well, it was a little, big, a little, big. and the same shape. It was big. <laughs> yeah, well, but yeah, we'll we'll do it in Japan. Yeah, and and yeah. Uh, I have a question that hopefully develops out of a, an impression I just um, yes. had um, when I saw you doing Atsumori in English. I have the feeling, I, and then afterwards um, at Blue Moon over Memphis, I wondered, are you experiencing different things when you're doing a, an already existing no play, putting it into English, or, uh, do, or when you're doing something up from the scratch? It seems to me, it seemed to me to come much, way more natural for Blue Moon over Memphis than for the English version of Atsumori, perhaps because they're so, so much uh, focused on the Japanese version. I don't know, but is, are there any differences when you're, when you're doing a Japanese, English, no play, or, or English, I'll, English, no play? I, I think maybe everyone has a slightly different perspective on that, maybe. Um, I know my personal perspective is, yes, it's easier to memorize the English, <laughs> You're starting from scratch. Um, for the most part it is. <laughs> I think there are some things that we've been around for a long time. And I think in our repertoire, because as our training has been, been mentioned, uh, maybe it hasn't been clear, our training is really all in Japanese. That is, I mean, do explanations, but we work on Japanese things. We don't really take our English repertoire and use it as part of our training. We do our training with Japanese, with Japanese teachers, and, and I teach a lot too, but all of it is Japanese song. I mean, for the most part, I would say 98%, a couple of things that we've done. But um, then, so we have that as the basis, and I think I've heard from our company members, the first time they do something in English, there's almost a slight revulsion to it. I mean, you know, like, uh, it, something about it doesn't feel the same. But, uh, but over time, I'm trying to basically do the same thing. But that said, language is different. You, you do have to do some things differently. But I feel like as we get better at it, 
um, the two will come a little bit closer together, but I don't know. What do you think, Laura? <laughs> you have any suggestions? Any thoughts? On, um, on English and, um, English and Japanese? Yeah. Nothing particularly. Oh, okay, <laughs> then I'm not going to spend the time. Did you have any thoughts on that? Um, I think we should actually go to another question okay. and maybe like two minutes. Is that? That's the question for the yes, sudden reaction. It's of my life. It's the first time I was hearing no with English, and uh, it, it did the opposite to me because I was oh my god, I was able to connect with the the words for the first time. Because usually what I learn is I memorize, but I don't have words for words. And now it was very interesting for me that there was a third dimension. There's the music, there's the dance, and the text that I could integrate all at the same time. And so for me. It's funny, but it, it was rather the, I, this was the opposite. I really enjoyed that. I mean, you could see the possibility for it. Obviously, we are all of different levels. I haven't trained anywhere near as long as Rick. Actually, it's interesting that, that Laura and Rick were the two presenters for this because Laura is our newest member of the company, and Rick is our is the person who founded and our oldest and most experienced member. Um, so it was a very, I think, a, a nice serendipitous uh, thing. Um, but one, one point uh, on that point, when we toured Pagoda, the play that we just showed, we toured it to London and some other venues in Europe. And I'll never forget, after the first performance in London, the opening night, there was a talk back. And there was a Japanese expat uh, from Japan um, who had come to see the performance. And she said, I've seen no in Japan, but I, I, I never understood anything what was going on. And she's watching it in her second language, and she could understand because <laughs> Because for many Japanese who do not, who are not as familiar with no, uh, they're listening to a very ancient sounding language and very, very, very densely written text. Um, and it's, I think, for the most part, um, indiscernible. So hearing it in English, even their second language is sometimes easier for them to make an immediate connection without having to, you know, process. Oh, thank you. <laughs> it's one of our, we, we performed this last summer, uh, and uh, one of our members is uh, Japanese, and she played the waki. Uh, and An so American her, woman. A woman, and, and, uh, uh, and her native tongue no, is Japanese, and so no, she, was, she was having a very uh, emotional experience because she's been, she's been doing know this for a long time, and she never had an emotional connection to the words. And so she was singing in English, and she was really trying to, she saw the emotional journey of the waki. That you, I mean, in regular now, you don't really think about the waki. As, oh, what's going to happen to the waki? Right? You know? so, uh, and so she was really like, wow, she was having a problem. It was really like an existential crisis about like because it's this is a play. We're making theater, yeah, but but it's no, and so there's this distance to it. And so by bringing English to it now, we're 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 shortening the distance between uh, the, the, the event and and the experience. It's an interesting. Which play was it? Sorry, the Tatsumori. That you're talking I know about. this is a blue moon. Blue moon. Well, I, I, well, yeah. I, I, as I wrote actually a little thing I wrote about this. I thought the ending, the the emphasis on the waki, is something that we don't get in no often. The, the waki goes off the stage, but often we think this has been a major event in the waki's life too. I mean, <laughs> Atsumori is is a case in oh, is yeah, a case yeah, in there, yeah, but right? there is no reaction. There's no time to show that because you know it's the stage, it, it's the the not the just style. the stage, the style. Yeah, yeah. yeah so. hmm. that's a very good point because Atsumori is a great example of that where. where where the, something could happen to right. the, the walkie. What did Kuma Gai got to get out of that? Yeah, I mean, like, red, 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 red wow. Uh, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I think we should probably stop there and give everybody a break and we'll come back. And uh, in the second half, we'll take a look at particular experiences with particular pieces of repertory. Thank you very much. Thank you.